Hi and welcome to this week's episode of I Just Need to Talk About This Film. This week I have Saffron with me. Hi. And she is amazing at editing and she is in the film industry so she knows her stuff. And uh, what are you talking about this week? I am talking about the film The Breakfast Club. came out in 1985 and is one of those classic cult films. Oh, interesting. I know it's the 35th anniversary at the moment as well. It came out this month in (laughs) 85, so... Was it 84? Yeah, eight, yeah, 85. Yeah, it came out the same year as like Back to the Future as well. So pretty big oh. moment for films in terms of anniversaries. Oh yeah, yeah, that would have been a bit of a a year off the 80s. Go back then. <laughs> they had good films. Anyway, um, are, you, are you good though? Are you hot where you are or...? Yeah, I won't lie. I did kind of set this up thinking it could be also a video recorded thing. So I've got two of those box lights either side of me. So I am still wetting right now. If you want to quickly turn them off, you can. I mean, I feel like I put the effort in. I want to Uh, keep them. Yeah, okay. If I start dying, I'd be like, one second, hang on. And then you'll hear switches come off and you're like, okay, now she's had enough. Yeah. So, (laughs) So what is it about The Breakfast Club that you want to talk about? So The Breakfast Club... Now, I feel I've got to kind of set the preference of if I watch a film, for me, there's either it's a bad film, an all right film, or a really good film. There's not really much in between for me. And um, The Breakfast Club was the one I'm like, I'm just so happy once I've seen it. And I think it's a really good example of a film which uses predominantly one location for the entirety of the film. So, uh, Livy, have you seen The Breakfast Club? Yeah, I've seen it many times. Okay, so you're familiar, but for those of you uh, listening who aren't familiar with the film, basically it's these five kids that have been brought in on a Saturday morning to do the detention with like the vice principal kind of supervising them. And uh, they're all from different backgrounds, social groups and like friendship groups at school. So they're not people that would really cross each other's lives, but they're all brought together into this one room to serve Saturday detention for various things wrong um that they did at school and yeah it kind of explores mostly uh through word a lot of films are like oh the rule is don't show no don't tell show but this one is one of the examples where you can tell it because it's a lot of conversation between the students so i've written down uh the people that they had in so there's the brainy character who's played by anthony michael hall and his character's name is brian johnson and he's very much, um, he was a stay at home and study. You know, that's kind of, he just does well at school. He's a bit of a nerd. And then you have like the prom queen kind of character played by Molly Ringwald. And her character's name is Claire Standish. And she's very much the queen bee, the very popular one. And wouldn't necessarily rub shoulders with some of the other members in there. You've got the classic jock character played by Emilio Estevez. And the character's name is Andrew Clark. And he is somebody that is just stereotypical American, like high school football player, but his dad is very pushy of him. And like these kind of beliefs that their parents have kind of also shows through their character as they open up about conversations about why they're there or maybe what they like to do at school and how they are. And then you have the rebel or criminal um, played by Judd Nelson called John Bender. And he is... He's the one that causes a lot of chaos and probably the most interesting person to watch. For example, just in case we continue and I say spoilers, there are spoilers in this for those who are listening. Um, So he'll set fire to his shoe and then light a cigarette off of it. There's little things that he does and even the way he presents himself in terms of mannerisms. He is very much, you look at him and think, yikes, he's going to be committing some crimes when he's older. And then I think the last uh, character who's in this attention is a a reclusive character. She kind of keeps to herself and is also considered quote unquote basket case in like the film's terminology. Uh, So that's played by Alan Sheedy, Ali Sheedy, sorry. Yep. And her character's name is Alison Reynolds. And she's very much, she wears all black, not because she's like a goth or anything, but the blackness kind of helps her to like be in the shadows and not be noticed that much, I suppose. And when she's first introduced as a character, she just communicates in noises. But then she eventually starts talking. Uh, she becomes quite good friends with the jock, Andrew. And then as the film kind of goes on, 
they end up coupling some of these people up, which I'm not sure if I like agree with too much or not, but it was just interesting to see like the evolution and it led to uh, Andrew actually quite liking her when Claire gave her a makeover and like kind of brought her out of a shell a little bit. Um, but because it's basically these characters plus like Mr. Vernon, the vice principal, who comes in every now and again, and then the caretaker who comes in every now and again, the interaction is very much between these five and how their dynamics work. And because it is very much centered in this library looking building with the occasional shot down a corridor or something, and maybe one in the gym, like it doesn't really move too much from where they are. And I just think it's a really clever way to show a really heartwarming story in some ways of these people's lives without having to put flashy like camera movements in or like, you know, strange props that will cost a lot to make. And I was interested to see comparatively like how much this film costs to make compared to say other releases that came out in 85. So the budget for The Breakfast Club was 1 million US dollars, which I thought was really low. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but when you compare it to what film budgets tend to be, for example, in 85, Back to the Future was $19 million to make. And some, I think it's some Oma, St. Omar's Fire that also came out in 85. Uh, yeah, their budget was 10 million US dollars. So when you kind of look at it comparatively, because they have taken a lot of the, I don't know what to call it, it's kind of like Hollywood, quote unquote, um, like locations or set deck or like costumes because it's very much everyday clothes there are no costume changes it's all in the same time period um yeah so a lot of the money i think is saved by making these very clever decisions to keep it in one place and to have only one costume per character that you see so because of all these things and because it is more of a story driven film as opposed to action which has a lot of camera movements and very specific editing uh, yeah, it's obviously saved a lot of money, but it wasn't that they were scrimping because they kind of focused on the bits that were important, which were the characters and the de de uh, development, sorry. So yeah, I think it was quite a clever move in terms of filmmaking. And I know this like sounds bad, but I do actually quite like those reality shows like Big Brother and even to an extent Love Island because it is very much all these people kept in one room and the entertainment kind of comes from who they are and like their own stories. So it's kind of like a scripted version of that in some ways, particularly like using Big Brother as an example, it's all housemates confined to one area that they wouldn't normally meet in, like people across the world that wouldn't normally meet. So I think that's a very good uh, comparison to make. And Big Brother did really well for several years because of this interesting infrastructure that made the show what it was. And even though this is obviously scripted, it did hold those kind of values in this film. So I thought, it's just a bit different, really, compared to some of the other stuff out there. So I quite liked it for that. Um, but yeah, obviously, it is an old film, and things might not have dated so well if you were to watch it now. Uh, I think there's only like a few things that kind of like may have been uncomfortable. Being um, there is like a few scenes, very brief, uh, where I think Claire is like sexually harassed by Bender. So I got notes. Here. I'm just making sure I'm getting my facts right. You know. And um, even though they're arguably minor-ish things or just comments you might make, um, I don't know if it's because I'm a girl watching it or because it's the time period that I'm watching looking back on, but it just makes me feel really uncomfortable. And uh, there's another one where I think it's Alison. She makes up a lie. So she does a lot of lying in the film, but then will tell the truth eventually. So she made a lie saying that she was an infomaniac. So they're all up on like the top balcony of the library and they're all kind of sharing secrets. And everybody reacts to that really badly, pretty much. But I think it's mostly because of the views held back in the 80s, being that women weren't really allowed to be, like, express their sexuality. Alison then, like, takes that back and goes, oh, it's a lie. But whether it was a lie or not, I just think the way everyone reacted, and also in terms of prodding Claire for information, that she had no right to kind of... Like, it wasn't their right to give it out. So I think it's a case of the way the female characters are made uncomfortable at certain points I didn't like, and looking back isn't great, but I will just kind of let that rest because I know it was a while ago, and if things are to be, say, rewritten now, like if The Breakfast Club was, make, was made today, I think they would have changed that bit. And it wasn't just the girls that were targeted, it was also the guys 
is, I think, because one of the reasons, uh, I think his name was, where is it, where is it, where is it? Yeah, Andrew. Because Andrew being the stereotypical jock, uh, even though as a jock, he was a character that didn't really have much say on what his own life was like. He was a bit, not an airhead, but he was very much led by the views and opinions of others. And that included a father which is why he ended up getting in detention anyway because his dad was like oh no I was at school I was doing like all these crazy pranks and getting so much trouble and like having a great time and because he was very much to the T like trying to be a good kid and we just in the sport he ended up doing a prank a bit off that then got him in trouble but that was kind of driven by this idea his dad had put into his head and because his dad had a certain standard he wanted his son to be at it was an example of how the boys also had standards or like expectations or beliefs put against them. So I think because it was the 80s, they did have this very male female stereotype put upon the characters. And it was interesting, I guess, to watch from a historical point of view, but also something I'd rather wouldn't be, say, shown in more modern films, because I'd like to think we'd come a bit further than that. But yeah, I think that's kind of covered everything I wanted to say, other than the music at the end was probably iconic. And I can't get simple minds out of my head now. Yeah. So you've, you've raised a lot of um, good points. Because um, with like, for example, like, I'll just go off of the last thing you just said. Well, a few of the articles that have come out recently, because obviously it is the 35th anniversary at the moment, is saying how the film would not be made today because of this. There would be so much more PC towards the film. But also the stereotypes in it, like... You know, we have the princess, the basket case, the jock. And I think even though we do still have them stereotypes, and I would say that The Breakfast Club is like one of the main films that created them for these chick flicks and for teenage films going on. And they've been developed and changed many, many times. Um, it Yeah, it, if it got made today, it wouldn't, a lot of it wouldn't go over and you have to that's the one of the debates with watching old films especially right now with uh stuff like gone with the wind you have to look yeah. at it in its historical context you can say that even then that was still not okay but it did go under the radar and i cannot find it but i rewatched it about three years ago and i wrote a really big review on it and i can't fully remember what I said but I know I didn't like it for some reason and I f- you mean your think, review or the film yeah the the, fi- the film I re-watched it and I remember thinking this wasn't how I remembered it and I think it is because um it's one of them films that a lot has been influenced by it that sometimes when you then go back to the first ever inf- the like the first ever time it happened it can kind of feel bland and a bit um stereotypical but it's because that is where the the development has come from but also I remember and I think it is the issues that you just said like I remember saying that I didn't like the sexual harassment in it and um like one of them I can't remember his name like the the rebel guy like I remember thinking it's I think he's mostly called him Bender yeah because he, he's like cute but then at the same time he has a lot of issues um, in one review that I've uh, found that's like a reflection says that um, even though like the character the character development in this film is basically amazing and it's it really does make a narrative out of just characters which is it's not rare but it, it's it's not the done thing so much in, in the sense of just having you know a bunch of people in a room and you just find out about their lives through dialogue um, but obviously, yeah, he, he's borderline abusive himself, even though he's clearly been abused at home and school. And I think it is really like tiny things like that, but they are characters we know. Even today, there are, there are people like that around. Um, I think one point that, going back to kind of what you were saying in the early, in the early moments when you were saying that you should show, not tell, I yeah. talked about this, I've talked about this many times because Hitchcock is obviously who came up with this. A film could basically have no dialogue and you should be able to follow it and know exactly the character's intentions and the narrative. 
I'm older and I'm wiser now. So I'm not kissing his ass like I did when I was 19 and first started film studies. Um, mm-hmm. he's, he's wrong in many ways. And I think bringing back this point of you can have a lot happen in dialogue because dialogue is how we communicate. It is. Like, it, yeah, okay, on a film you can, you know, someone's eye movement will tell you something as well as if someone is scared and they, it's whose hand they grab or these really tiny touches of if there's a bomb in a room but the actors don't know, the actors, I mean the characters don't know but the audience knows it creates more suspense and so on. But when it comes to film films like this where it's about character development, their dialogue and how they interact with each other is the driving force of the narrative. So if Hitchcock watched this film, he would probably hate it, but he's obviously wrong because I would say that more people have actually watched The Breakfast Club than half of his films. And that's the two. <laughs> Even that's, though he is that's the two. That's the two. Um, I think the only other points that I've been seeing coming up, because there obviously is a lot of like re reviews of this film because of it being the 35th anniversary, is... Um, again, the points that you've already set, said that these characters exist in isolation within the film, you don't know how they go on beyond this this day. Even though it's like hinted at, you don't know if what they said earlier on in the film is going to happen. Like the princess might just walk past them all and act like she does not know them. And they might have not changed the status quo or they might have, you, you, you don't know. And I like the fact that this was a story within itself. Um, I did actually find a review from uh, 1985 from Robert Elbert, who I have, I do recognize his name, but he gave it three stars, which I think is really funny for some reason, because I'm not how many. Out of five, uh-huh. which is like, so it's like, that's what, like 60, 70%. But then on Rotten Tomatoes right now, it's at 92 for audiences and 89 for um, like the reviewers. Um, he doesn't say much, like he gives a lot of what the narrative is about because that is what a lot of Bob Basic reviews are. But I think there's this one bit that I'm just going to read out that I think is still relevant is that nothing happens in The Breakfast Club, um, which is all that's surprising. The truths that are exchanged are more or less predictable. The kids are fairly standard hang-ups. It comes with no surprise. For example, you learn that the jock's father is a perfectionist or that the prom queen's parents give her material rewards without um, withholding their love. But The Breakfast Club doesn't need earth-shaking revelations. It's about the kids who grow willing to talk about one another. And I think that is basically the point of the film and why it's kept around and why people rewatch it and rewatch it. We all have a stereotype in a way, you know, we all present ourselves in one way. We all have a friendship group, especially when we're in, you know, high school. And then there is more to everyone. You know, someone's parents are divorced, someone's mum has died, someone has has an I don't know a bad background someone has more money someone is poor it's you know and I think that is one of the reasons that it, the breakfast club hasn't died it's just pretty much stuck around obviously John John Hughes um also made 16 candles the year earlier and he is basically the reason for the brat pack um and pretty much all of them are in the breakfast club um <laughs> I think what I find really fascinating about this review from 1985 is the only thing it says at the end is the only weakness and um, the only weakness is the writing of the adult characters as they are very one dimensional, one noted and the kids do not pay much attention to them. But that's the point I find like it's like saying that is even though it's only noted, it also misses the point. The narrative isn't about the adults. It's about the children. and well teenagers and it's their story and of course the adults are going to be one dimensional they literally only say like one line if it's the parents or like the teacher he's meant to be shown as ridiculous i would argue that the teacher um has some kind of like control thing Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah i think throughout the film like even going through the confidential file cabinet it's those kind of things he was trying to assert himself and his powers to be higher than maybe what his station was 
and mm-hmm. perhaps maybe belittling the kids, particularly Bender. It's just little things like that that perhaps he didn't get approval when he was younger and now he's trying to control something when he's older. But back to what you were saying, sorry, about the, um, it being a self-contained film, mm-hmm. which one I really like, but I'm also kind of like, I wish they had made a sequel in the day. Like, I don't want them to touch it now. Like, do not go anywhere near that, please. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really wonder what it'd be like if there was a Breakfast Club 2 or even maybe a special, like, you know, they do Christmas specials or whatever, mm-hmm. which would be like an hour-long thing where you see the characters in their original friendship groups and whether they would interact with each other or what the broader dimensions of that school life would be like. Um, so, yeah, they're all what-ifs, but I think part of the reason... I think that's because the film, the first film was so good, being that because it does leave you thinking, it's like, oh, wow, it's left me thinking about the film. It kind of leaves all options open. Yeah. I think uh, one other, like, review on Rotten Tomatoes that I found was someone saying that it's basically like a play. And I think, yeah, that is kind of also where it comes from. Like, you can imagine this kind of happen. I think it has happened on stage, actually. I was going to say, like, you could, it's one of them, there's nothing like, you can't say, oh, the cinematography was amazing because it was pretty basic in a way. There's nothing um, like revolutionary about it. Um, but like you said, I think the fact that the costumes were re- like were very simple. Obviously, one million, I didn't know it was only one million, but that does kind of make sense because I know like Home Alone, which obviously was 90s, I know they were 50 million for the first Home Alone film and that was a push apparently like they were really wanted 20 million <laughs> and like so I think when you like put it in perspective of how much you could get for like 15 million or 90 million was Back to the Future right one million kind of feels right because like you said there's no costume design well there is costume design obviously they are perfectly costume designed but there isn't like, loads going on and then I'm pretty sure the set I bet if I looked into it I'm can't imagine them actually doing much to it I bet they just found a school and just were like that would do um, I don't think it's a sound stage or anything I think it was an actual school wasn't it I'm not sure I didn't research that but but again like you think I don't think I'd be surprised if I found out it was a school it'd make it yeah. easier on the locations department <laughs> exactly they were just like here's a school I do know like in the 80s there was a thing about a lot of schools were just um these like teen films would have been filmed in this in the summer or mm. winter break just because they could then have access to these schools for example high school musical <laughs> that's so stupid <laughs> but that's how like that got filmed because they just like waited until the summer and then like filmed then while, while kids weren't around um i guess yeah i guess we have time so i'll move on to what my mind's a rant basically <laughs> so i just the other day on ITV2, Legally Blonde 2 was on. And I ran, I just moaned the whole way through it. Because Legally Blonde, as in one, is my heart, my love. Elle Woods is life. I have so many, like, stickers of her, quotations. I will re-watch Legally Blonde at least once or twice a year it's just so empowering and it's disguised as a chick flick and in Legally Blonde 2 I am so sorry to Reese Witherspoon I am so sorry that you got contracted to do this you deserved better and I am so I'm really looking forward to because they have announced that they are doing Legally Blonde 3 and Reese Witherspoon is producing so I have hopes and they have brought back a lot of the original team. So I have high hopes. We'll see how it goes. But Legally Blonde 2, Red, White and Blonde. It is a cheap homage to the original. Where Legally Blonde is a brat doll, Legally Blonde 2 is the Poundland bargain bucket version. The original... It looks like the original when you're drunk or just need a void feeling, basically. The substance of the original is not there. The themes, the topics are out the window. And it has looked at it and just gone, oh, it was a chick flick because people liked the fact that a blonde girl did something right. That was not the point of Legally Blonde. 
Legally Blonde was a fair shit, right? Elle Woods is a very clever girl. She had already got a really high G, um, like SAT score. I don't know. I'm, I'm not American. She was clever as hell. It's just that she liked fashion, as in that is what her major was in. She gets dumped by her boyfriend and she wants him back because love. So she decides, I'm going to get into Harvard. She works hard as hell and she gets a higher score than him. She goes beyond the asking grade and gets in on her merits. She then works bloody hard and finds that she likes law. So she actually finds her purpose while still having nice hair and having nice clothes, which in reality, especially these days, because, well, because she is an icon and I think she's influenced a lot of people. That is how a lot of girls are. We, like, and this is not me and this is not me stamping all girls because women are amazing and they're diverse. But Elwood's just fit this dynamic demographic of women who liked having their hair done their nails done but that does not mean they are not intelligent that does not mean they are not clever so it is such a feminist icon film and then Lily Blonde 2 just didn't realize that basically they just think it's a chip flick about a lawyer and it hurts my brain so much <laughs> so where Legally Bond demonstrates that a woman is more than her looks, enjoys clothes, and has a, a fully working brain, Legally Blonde 2 shows that a blonde bimbo stereotypes, which, which Elle Woods never was, can basically just accidentally stumble into these law situations. Um, the director, is who, who, who I'm not even going to mention his name, uh, did has done nothing worthy mentioning after or before Legally Blonde 2. Um, and the language um, and Kat, Kate Condell, who wrote the Legally Blonde 2, went on to write the Tinkerbell films, which pretty much makes sense. The clothes, the clothes. So, in the original film, Elle Woods has a different hairstyle in every scene. Every single scene, you will never see her wear that same hairstyle twice. And her clothes are designer and perfection. They are not tacky. You can rewatch it and still say that outfit snaps. But Legally Blonde 2 was the, took the early noughties Paris Hilton look. Low jeans, crop top, it's awful. It's tacky as hell. And the main scene that annoys me so much is she gets these wedding shoes for her wedding and they're pink, and then when she lifts her foot up, it has, I'm not even joking, it's like stuck on pink gems on the bottom of her shoe. It is, Elle Woods would never, she would never be caught dead in that. Okay. And then the narrative is just so annoying because basically she wants to reunite her dog with its mum, and that's how she finds this like animal cruelty basically and what annoys me so much is it's never really addressed she just kind of goes i want my dog's mother to be at my wedding that is the narrative so she then makes a campaign and a law case to abolish to to shut down this one facility that makes like cosmetics cosmetics but it just makes no sense because she never says for example, like, animal cruelty is wrong. We shouldn't be testing on animals. All she does is go, I want my dog's mum out of this place. It's, oh. And then the tactics used just makes no sense. Just, for example, it would have worked so much better if she was a, like, she is a serious lawyer. If she was, like, a serious lawyer and then someone came up to her and was like, look, please, can you help me? Please, can you take on this case against animal cruelty? This is happening then it would make more sense she would then have a kick into like the hero's journey in a way and the narrative would make much more sense than rather than her just being like i want my my dog's mum to be at my wedding i'm pretty sure your dog's mum is actually dead like dogs only live like 15 years and you've already had your dog for like 10 um, oh it just hurts my soul Honestly, I could keep going on about it, but it's just not even 
like the stupid stuff like the snap cup the filling it's just a disappointment to the original and should be deleted from cinema basically that's it that's my rant i'm over (laughs) well that sounds like the most terrible film i've ever heard there's just so much (laughs) the only worst (laughs) film is and you have going a part of it is called the dead and the others right so it's mini mm-hmm. like side rant of like th- this is my rant for a horror horrible film um basically a few years ago i was at the bfi london film festival and in the brochure Ooh, look at you like, <laughs> i'm a nerd <laughs> <laughs> my life just goes just outside the film and in the brochure it seemed pretty good like it's about this tribe and it talked about shamanism, and I thought, ooh, supernatural, you know, beyond the grave, tribe culture, that could be a really cool film. And it was like, it was a Brazilian film as well, so it was like international, it wasn't like box standard Hollywood bull sometimes, let's be honest, it isn't always that great. So I thought, cool. And I went along, and my friend fell asleep twice, and I made the mistake of waking them up twice, and it was just the worst film in history. It was just so slow of pace and nothing made any sense and they could have like wrapped it up in 20 minutes but they took two and a half hours to do so <laughs> and i'm not going to go on any more than that but the point is that is where the lowest point for me goes and i recently found out that it won something at cans i'm like how oh what? my god i know and he said my friend sent me the article saying this and was like i don't understand i'm like neither do i <laughs> but basically yeah so i think by the sounds of it we've got the dead and the others at the bomb for me here mm-hmm. and just off that review legally blonde 2 is just maybe a smidgen <laughs> above <laughs> legally blonde 2 is just heartbreaking it just hurts oh oh the snap cup just gets me like so there's a scene where she <laughs> <laughs> she goes into a new job right and it's like they give her a desk and within like obviously it's just like a, a cut but it's meant to be like two hours or so later and she has made her desk like pink ribbons i can't write it's not even i'm not gonna give it justice but it's like like a barbie doll has like exploded over her desk <laughs> <laughs> and she's wearing like a pink outfit as it is that looks like what jackie like would wear but pink like barbie pink it's all it's an awful outfit as it is and elwood i said even though her signature color is pink it's not like that and basically to get to know her like co-workers who already do not like her because they're all like serious lawyers who are like (laughs) in like suits and like sitting down doing work and all she's been doing for the last two hours is like decorating her bloody desk (laughs) it's like the snap cup so she gets a cup and you've all got to like write something in that you're like grateful for for someone else and uh she like opens it and she's like so it says like i really like i can't remember the person's name but i really like samantha's outfit she looks very nice and it makes her cheekbones look good snaps and like you snap (laughs) and then like it's just the most awful thing and obviously they just put stuff like I want to kill myself because this is the awfulest game ever (laughs) and I'm like why would Elle Woods do this she would never she is optimistic and happy but that is just too far but then it like becomes a thing within the narrative so at the end there's like congress where like the government all (laughs) are there and they do snap (laughs) and it's like you all these serious lawyers and they're just like so and so has got a grandson today snaps (laughs) i just can't like it honestly it killed me and i hope i never watch that film again i do think we should just like i hope they don't call legally blonde three legally blonde three i really hope they call it just legally blonde the white house or something like because that is like what it's like hinted to be about like her running for president (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which actually sounds ridiculous but <laughs> anyway um thanks for talking to me and letting me have a rant and also let, talking about the breakfast club the cult classic well, thanks for having me yeah and if any time if you ever think of another film come back and we'll discuss something because you know this is just i have to talk about this film it doesn't have to be good doesn't have to be bad tell you what i'll make an essay of everything i hate about the dead and the others and i'll come back to you <laughs> Please do. I'm not even kidding. I have a like a draft I, used to, I did for a blog because the BFI Academy, we had to do blogs and one of them was a film review. So I was like rolling up my sleeves. I'm going to make this film dirty. I'm not going to make it good. Oh and God. I just slated them all the way through. But I feel I can do better. So I'll just redo it and then come back with it. Oh my God, please do. 
Anyway, right, bye and also have a nice evening and stuff.